Hi everyone, we're a little earlier than we normally are today. I'm here with Jill Vitale. Um, she is the president and CEO of the Eden Alternative. And if any of you have watched the video that I sent in my invite email, you will know that she has some wonderful experiences that she's gonna talk about with us today. And she's really um, resonated with me, I feel like, because I, I understood senior care. Yeah, me and you got each other. I understood senior care, right? And I, I knew what we were doing, but I didn't realize that when we develop these homes, right? Because we're all in homes, we're not really creating a second home sometimes. We're just creating a, a senior care facility, right? And, and it's very easy to get institutionalized and just go along with what you would do in another facility when really we should be even more than any other senior care place out there making a second home. We have the structure to make a second home and we have the ability to seamlessly bring our elders from their home and from their normal life into a new routine with a new family in a new home. So that's some things that, that uh, we're gonna talk about today. It's gonna be just like this, just uh, Jill and I just talking just like this. And if any time you guys want to pop in, just pop into the questions and type in what you want to say, and I'll include you in our conversation. Um, also, if you have any questions just from watching the video, I know that was a lot of information. It was a very cool story that Jill had from surviving a hurricane, really. Um, then go ahead and type those in now, and we'll try and address those throughout. So, Jill, how are you? How's Colorado? Uh, things are good in Colorado, and I am doing well considering everything that's going on. I'm really glad to be here with all of you today. We're all kind of stuck in that uh, lonely boredom state that we're going to talk a little bit about avoiding today, right? Yes. All right. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you came to be with the Eden Alternative? Sure. So I was um, an well, my very first job in the field I worked in, uh, we used to call them dietary aids uh, in, in a nursing home when I was in high school. Uh, and I, you know, I have to say it wasn't a great start, right? Because this was back in the 80s and it was very institutional and, you know, tray lines and kind of all the institutional things you can think of were happening there. Um, but years later, as, as many of us do, we kind of find our our way back to this field. And so I uh, have been a nursing home administrator. I've been in the field for over 20 years. I've been a nursing home administrator and assisted living um, executive director um, and have run continuing care retirement communities. And, you know, my whole world changed when I went to an, an Eden alternative training. Um, and the, all of your homes have ombudsmen too, right? They go and visit their communities. Mm -hmm. And so the ombudsman that came to the nursing home I was running, uh, she talked me into it. And she said, you, you know, you're, you have really good um, surveys and things are going well here, but would you, would you really want to live here? You know, and that's, you, a, that's a great question to be asked, yeah. right? You're like, well, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So she, eventually convinced me to go and I my eyes were opened that it didn't have to be that way it didn't have to be waking everybody up at a certain time every morning and the medical model running the show and you know people really giving up on life which is what happens in the institutional framework you know you walk in and you see people slumped over in a nursing home we've all seen it and it's not because of their physical um you know their diagnoses or anything like that it's they're lonely they're helpless they're bored the human spirit has died mm -hmm. and so once i went to that training i started implementing the eden alternative in my communities um and really drove oh my goodness i'm so sorry um really <laughs> drove I, I saw what happened when when the people that lived in the community were empowered and the people that worked in the community were empowered and i just I was, you know, completely um, on board with Eden Alternative, and eventually, as time went on, you know, I became a board member, and and I started doing trainings. And two years ago, I I got my dream job, which is to lead this organization. 
So that it's, is so amazing. So the founder of, of Eden Alternative is Dr. Bill Thomas. Is that who was in charge when you transitioned um, two years ago? No, he had he had left, and there was a CEO named Chris Perna that was okay. uh, running the community for about eight years before before I came on board. Uh, Bill's still involved with us. He's always a, a supporter, and we, you know, I go, reach out to him a lot for for feedback and insight on things. So he's he's still very much involved. And so you had really worked your way up in the organization to the point. And how long has Eden been around? Twenty five years. 25 years so about as long as you've been in the industry eden has been around yeah yeah and it was you know started but bill thomas was a, a a physician a medical director in a nursing home and that what i just said about he, he realized that yeah. people weren't suffering so much from being old or having a you know a, a hip fracture or whatever other kind of medical problems they had that they were suffering, and we say that it, it comes from loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. That's causing the vast majority of suffering for older, not just older people. There are also, you know, younger people who need supportive services, and they're often institutionalized too. So that's what we do as we work with organizations around the world um, to change that that paradigm. So then, did you go to implement Eat an Alternative into the current facility you were working at? Yes, I did that in two communities where I was. Yeah, and, and what was the change? How did that come? Well, so so here, the the first place I did this, I I had a really big learning opportunity, and that was I thought I had to own it all and make it all happen, and I was like the savior that would save my community, and I did all the training, and you know I got recruited away to go to another community, and when I left, it all fell apart, and. You know, at first I was like, oh, I must be such a good leader because you know, if that's not it, I was not a good leader because what you have to do with this work is empower leadership with everybody in the organization. Mm -hmm. So when I went to the second place, it was actually a very large continuing care retirement community. And we started in the nursing home doing this work. And um, it really helped us in in a lot of ways. You know, we were having regulatory challenges and all these issues, and 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 we were able to um, get back in regulatory compliance, doing it the right way rather than institutional methods. Um, and then the residents that lived in assisted living and independent living said, "Why are you just focusing on the nursing home? We are lonely and helpless oh. and bored too." And so what it really did is we, we what we really did was we, then we really created a community, yeah. right? Where the people yeah. that lived there, where it wasn't, you know, and I could go into this whole thing about the hospitality model, but it, you know, it wasn't, I, I, we are here to take care of you. It was every single person that lives and works here has a role to play. Mm -hmm. And we were able to accomplish, I mean, we were in a, the middle of a huge, construction re, construction redevelopment project during all this and the residents there really drove this change so we stopped segregating people living in the nursing home people living with dementia and created an inclusive community and we also um, were able to bring together people of different socioeconomic backgrounds so we had HUD we had really high rate life plan communities and it's it wasn't me that did it. It wasn't my leadership team that did it. It was really giving people back the voice and the opportunity to do what they know how to do. And so they really created this new culture where you know everybody is honored. It doesn't matter if you are, what physical challenges you're living with, what um, cognitive challenges you're living with. That, that everybody was honored and accepted and you know at the same time our financials got better our occupancy shot up because people want to live in a situation like that you and know? you're going to get way better reports from the family from the people who live there i can't tell you how many times my grandma when we ended up having to eventually put her in assisted living would say why do i have to live here you know the food's horrible this is boring, the, my, the neighbor's mean, you know, all sorts yeah. of stuff. And it was like heartbreaking because we didn't know. And eventually we did end up putting her in a residential care facility and things got a thousand times better. Yeah. And so that's kind of segues here into 
most of your facilities that you had started with were nursing homes, correct? Yeah, uh, well, Which yeah. Is an alternative? Yes, a lot of the organizations we work with are nursing homes. We don't call them facilities. Oh, I'm Nobody sorry. To live That's okay, that's okay. I'm just, we call it the F word. So you just use the F word. <laughs> I've said the F word a lot. <laughs> F-bomb, I was teasing you. Um, but yeah, we work with a lot of nursing homes, but we also work with continuing care retirement communities, home care organizations. Uh, people get are institutionalized in their own homes. Right, but right? really what this means is if you can do this in a nursing home where there's 50 to 100, even more residents, how much easier is it gonna be able to do it in a home? Yes, and the other thing that I think your members um, have in their court is you know you could talk about there, there's two there's two parts of this there is the hardware which is the physical structure of the building mm -hmm. and you already have home right and it's small groups of people living living together and it, it feels like a home but if if you just have that physical structure and we see this happen all the time where organizations they rebuild and they're like we're getting rid of the long hallways and we're creating small households if you don't get new software which is the way you think the way you work the way you approach things it's still an institution it's just smaller it's so making, true right and so yeah you're you're that's why one of the many reasons i'm so excited to to talk with all of you is you've already got a leg up on this and that I, and really that was the epiphany in our initial conversations for me it was like you're right, Do, the, someone can come into our homes and have the same routine. I mean, we can have them in the kitchen with us. It's not a commercial kitchen in the back that only a few people see. It's a kitchen in the middle of the house. They can do all of the same things they were doing at their home to take care of their home because we have a home to take care of. Um, right. And, and right. you, Eden Alternative is worldwide, correct? Yes, we were, last year we were in 19 countries around the world. Yeah. And you had a pretty cool story that I know I watched on one of your other interviews about going to a home in Australia, correct? Yes. Um, yes. So I visited. So that's the other interesting thing is there are big organizations that are recreating what you all have, right? Yeah. And so I was at this community in Australia and one of our Eden Registry homes there. And it was, um, it was a, a campus, but they had households. And uh, in, in this particular household I went into, it was individuals, all individuals living with dementia. And, um, and it was beautiful, an open kitchen, kind of like you would have if you walked into you know, a newly designed home with the open space. Yeah. And, and so I asked um, one of the team members there, um, I said, you know, do the, do the residents here, do they help make, do they help cook? And I'm thinking because what I'm used to here in the US so many times is I, I was expecting her to say, yeah, well, they help prep food and, you know, we bake cookies once a week. Um, and she just looked at me like, why would you even ask me that? And she said, of course, all the residents participate in meals. I, I'm the only staff person here. And if everybody didn't work together, we wouldn't have dinner. And so the residents there are, it's not, it's the way I look at it is we a lot of times manufacture opportunities for a sense of purpose. And that is not the same thing as having real purpose. So the people that live in that community are a critical part of the functioning of that home. So and most like, places don't think of it that way, right? Right, right. We're all like, let's give people a little something that feels, let's give people a bunch of towels to fold and yeah. then we'll take it in the back and then we'll mess them all up and give them to them again to fold. You know, yeah. it's that kind of mindset. And, um, you know, at that community, um, they people get up in the morning and they cook their breakfast. Um, the guys there, not I, this isn't being sexist. This is what they told me, but the guys there, use power tools and help fix stuff that needs to be fixed around the community. People iron their clothes with a, a real iron, you know, and it's just that, and it's home. Yeah. And I sat there and visited with the people there and they, I was in their home for tea. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And that is such a 
big difference from what you usually have where you go to an event and, and you have staff running around doing everything. Um, it was home and you could tell, and they were, they were hosting me being there and our group being there. And so do you feel like they were more interactive with you because of the way they were living in this home? Yes. Than our experience here where you come in and maybe they're brought out to you to come and visit. But I think so many, and something that hit me that you said in our initial conversation is, or not really, it was actually in your video, was that they're diagnosed with disorders that they don't have because of behaviors that they have because they've been taken from their home because they don't have their family with them because they don't have their routine so then they get diagnosed with depression or anxiety or any of these other disorders and then medicated for those which then creates even more helplessness boredom and lonesomeness right right absolutely and you know we don't we we really um we talk about people it, it's somebody having an unmet need yeah Right. And, and, you know, what, like when I shared, when I shared that video about being, you know, trapped after that hurricane, um, all the things that I, we were doing, you know, I was hoarding food, you know, I, we were all trying to, we were wandering, right. We were, we were elopement risk. Trying to escape. <laughs> yeah. All these things were a result of really we were institutionalized and, yeah. and that's what happens so often is we put people in these situations and then they react and then we call it a behavior mm -hmm. and we blame the person rather than looking at what's really going on and i i would just point out too is we're all experiencing this right now and we yeah. were talking about this a little bit that with what's going on with with the pandemic you know, we are lonely. We don't get to be with the people. And, and yes, it's nice to have video conferencing, but you know, there is something about being with people and the people that you want to be with and having a hug and all these things. So we've got this unbelievable loneliness and people are going to extreme lengths. What, there's an organization I was talking to who said that a family had brought in a bucket truck because their mom lived on an upper floor in a community and they brought in one of those lift trucks so they could actually see their mom. Like that's how much, that's how much it, it, me, it matters, right? To have yeah. deep and meaningful relationships. Um, we're helpless. Somebody else is making all the decisions about our lives right now. You so know, it, it, it's all about the medical model right now, which is very, which is what the institution is. You know, you can do this, you can't, and I'm not, I, I totally agree with what's going on and we need to do these things, but we still don't like it. No. Um, you know, I was running around when this all first started happening, my husband had a cough and I was like doing vital signs with him like every two hours. Do you have a fever now? How about now? Do you have a fever? And he was like, please stop. And that's what people live like in an institution, yeah. right? You don't have any control over your environment. So we're all feeling this pain of helplessness and you see us all trying to find ways to make a difference and give so back, true. right? And so that's like all how the webinars were all being sent, right? Everybody's like, yeah. I need to do something during this. I so I'm going to do 500 webinars. Yeah. So we say that that helplessness is the pain we feel when we never, when we only receive care and we never give care. Yeah. And so no matter how old we are, no matter if we're living with dementia or whatever our other diagnoses are, we all have this human need to give back. Yeah, but we're all feeling that and we're all bored, right? Sitting or so the, the other thing with this to remember with, with the boredom side of things is boredom is not alleviated by more things on the activity calendar. That's because, a great way to work it. Yeah, because if you think about it, you know what a lot of us are missing right now is spontaneity. Yes, yes, it's, it's true. not about having another scheduled zoom meeting or another show i'm scheduled to watch on netflix it's the i feel like getting up today and going out for breakfast oh can't do that ow that hurts right uh, i mm -hmm. feel like popping over next door to see my neighbor can't do that and so it's that that spontaneity and, and that's where i think we get off the rails a little bit in our field is people are bored so let's schedule more things but nobody wants to have their day scheduled from morning till night so it's about having meaning in everyday life 
yeah. and the opportunity for unexpected things to happen. Like your family pops by all of a sudden if you're in a yeah. residential home. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. whatever it is. You know, at my my old community that <laughs> The residents used to sit in the lobby with squirt guns and they would shoot me when I walked by with squirt guns. <laughs> like that was like their, and it was very unexpected, but that's the kind of like, everything doesn't have to be regimented and everything right. doesn't have to be on a calendar. It's, right. I feel like playing cards right now. So let's go play cards or whatever it is. Or I feel like going out for ice cream. Okay, let's get everybody in the home together and let's go out for ice cream. Yeah. Those kinds of things. So, I mean, obviously there's one aspect of trying to help with those behaviors, but what would you say are a few tips for people to avoid those three plagues in their homes? Well, what we, at the Eden Alternative, we frame everything around the do what we call the Eden Alternative domains of well-being. So there are things that all of us, that all of us need to be well, okay? So what, what we encourage people to do, and if people go to our website, edenalt.org, you can, you can find the domains of well-being. But, you know, loneliness, helplessness, and boredom, it, it looks different to everyone. It, and that means you have to know the person well. So you have to know what brings that person joy. Um, who is that person as an individual? Um, you know what how much privacy does someone need that's that's another thing and we were talking about that that you know right now you you don't have as much alone time and how that's impacting you so knowing a person well is the key so if i lived in that home in in australia and somebody said to me we're all going to cook i don't like to cook so you're yeah. not going to help me and my well-being if you said to me hey you know what it's time to plant the garden or hey, let's we need to paint this. I would be all about it. So it's about knowing each person as an individual and looking at all of the different things that matter to them. The other thing I would just point out is is autonomy. That's one of the Eden alternative domains of well-being. That's a huge one. And and I think that's where we run into a lot of trouble is um, you know, most people are more afraid of losing their independence than they are dying. Well, I mean, just thinking about it, right? So we don't think about it for the necessarily the individuals that are coming into our care, but we definitely would think about it if it was ourselves, right? Oh, absolutely. And so it's, are you supporting this person living their life the way they want to live it? And are they actively saying this is how i want to live my life today do people yeah. get up when and i'm assuming that happens in these homes get up when they want to get up mm -hmm. have eat what they want to eat have control over their own lives a, a lot of the trouble we get into i think with um you know if people ever get hit by someone who's living in a community yeah. um, a lot of times it's it's because we're undermining people's autonomy Absolutely. I mean, we, we would probably hit somebody too, right? If you get to that point where you feel like you have no control of your life and no one cares about what you want or what you need. And nobody yeah. knows who I am. They only know me by my yeah. diagnosis. Like those, it, it, it's all of these things together that really, you know, don't allow us to see people as human beings with full personhood. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great way to put it, right? Like each of the each of these people are human beings. They're coming into your home as another human being that wants to be treated as a human being. And you gave a great example when we initially talked in that if one of your residents used to like to make her own tea in the morning and then go out and garden for an hour, that was her routine in her house. And now that's been taken away. So if you yeah. get to know those things when they come in, that's part of your initial interview. And you can continue to do that. Just supply her with the tea that she likes and, you know, bring, have a garden or have something available so she can just go do her day like she normally would. It may not be exactly the same, but you can try at least, yeah. you know. And I think it's, you know, asking a lot of questions and listening. What do mm -hmm. people really want? And as much as you can. The other thing about being at home is that it, it is that you decide what happens there. So yeah. how much are people that live in that, that home involved in deciding how things happen there? Because that that's another thing that takes away from feeling at home. 
it's not your home if you can't decide what happens. No, it's absolutely. Absolutely not. And home like isn't enough. Like that's mm -hmm. that's that's building a building that looks like a home. That's exactly There's a lot true. Of things that go into it. So would you say that this experience you had with the hurricane was your most impactful experience? Or would you say there's another experience you've had in an assisted living, uh, I was gonna say the F word, in an assisted living community? <laughs> um, you know, that hurricane experience was, was pretty big because I like experienced a little bit of what, what life um, is like when you're institutionalized. But I would really say, you know, implementing the Eden Alternative Principles at, at that, that CCRC and just like seeing what could be accomplished, not from me doing something, but from being a community builder and bringing out the best in the people that live there, it, it, was, it was beyond anything that I ever thought I could do. And it's just really minor changes in all reality. It's changing the way that you word your, your you're the way you speak to people changing the way that you interact with your residents and changing the way that you think it's just those three simple things but it's simple but it's really hard we're all <laughs> stuck in our ways yeah we are and we've been given right and we've been taught our whole lives and right this minute all this media coverage every advertisement you read tells you things about what it is to be old mm -hmm. right now especially the whole narrative is frail, vulnerable to be protected. Yeah. You know, and we hear all the time about, you know, being older is a downward decline. You can't learn new things, blah, 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 blah. None of that is true. And if we, so getting rid of all that and thinking in a new way is hard. Yeah. It's hard, but that's what, what the Eden Alternative does, right? We help organizations get through all that because you have to change the way you think and you also have to change the way you you run your community yeah and, and you what, train your caregivers and your managers and all of those people it has to be completely different than it was before. it does and what you focus on what means success for a caregiver is it how many meds you can pass or is it supporting the well-being of, of residents so it, it's it's huge but it is simple but it's really hard to do but it's it's the most amazing journey you can never go on to do this. Well, I can imagine being a caregiver who are the main people who are with these people every single day or your managers or whoever they are, they would love to see a positive transition in a different direction. You know, and maybe add some elements of spontaneity to their day, right? So instead of it's the same mundane routine, you wake them all up at the same time, you do, you do breakfast and you feed them, this person doesn't like this or this person's doing this today, you know, you kind of throw it up, throw a curveball for the day. What do you guys want to do today, right? Yeah. So I well, think that's great. So the domains of well-being apply to, to employee caregivers too, right? And so, yes, so that's what we find is people, you know, they like their job more. That brings them back to the purpose. You know, so many people go to our trainings and they're like, I always knew it should be this way. You know, it's like you said, it's simple. But undoing the years of conditioning is is it's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, you guys can hear my your phone rang and now my dog barked in the middle. <laughs> so I mean we're at home and we're going a little crazy here. So no boredom over here. Just right, so. right, right. <laughs> um, all right. So um let's see, what else did I want to talk about? And my family just threw me off right now, right? Um, you guys have a virtual training that's getting ready to be implemented, right? Up until now, it's just been an in-person training, correct? Yes, we've done some, you know, live webinar kind of trainings, but um, we do. We So we have an online on-demand learning platform called Evolve Online Learning, and that is launching um, July 1st. And so this is a, an amazing opportunity um, for people like I think especially your members um, and we're so glad to have the partnership we do with you all but to get education we've got doctor a class from Dr. Al Power who's a, a world-renowned geriatrician and expert in supporting the well-being of individuals living with dementia his course will be on there there's a leadership course that I developed there's a performance improvement uh, platform called growth 
that one of our team members has developed and we've got a lot of, uh, so those are all launching July 1st and then we're gonna be adding more and more as time goes on. Um, I would also encourage people, we, we're doing a lot of free things right now. So Evolve Online Learning, members of your organization will, will be able to do a great discount for them. And in, in during this pandemic, we're doing a lot of free education. So um, our Facebook page, we do uh, Facebook live shows every Monday where we interview different thought leaders. Um, and so there's a lot of, lot of opportunities just to kind of watch and learn and, and listen that way too. That's so wonderful. Once again, we're all sitting here trying to figure out how we can contribute and how we can help to society. So it's just another... And, and I can't tell you how much just having conversations, I haven't even gone through your training, but just having conversations with you has been impactful on my, just the way I think about, you know, getting elder and, and going into assisted living facilities. I would much rather choose one that has been trained with Eden Alternative. And it's very important. I mean, we're all, most of us here are probably owners, maybe owner operators. And it's very important to bring your staff not just train yourself, but bring your staff in and make sure your staff is trained um, the same way you are. Because as much as you can relay the message to them on how you want your home to be around, they can't really understand it until they personally have had the experience and watched it themselves or been involved with it and tried to implement those um, teachings themselves. So before, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and you can pop them in now. But before we go, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, a webinar we had with Jan Doherty. Jan Doherty is, um, if anybody missed this webinar, it was great. It's up on our blog page as a continuing education piece. But Jan Doherty is a specialist out here in Arizona for dementia care. She talks about traveling with dementia um, specifically, but she also trains firefighters and emergency services out here in Arizona to understand residents with dementia so that when they come into a situation that they've been called to, they're not as threatening as it would seem they could be, right? Um, Jan proposes an idea to develop a special unit, and this is almost like your alternative way um, to develop a specialized way of being with elder care. And that, if, if really, they say that 80% of the call volumes in a lot of these places are for senior related issues or incidents, then it would make sense, just like you said, to have specialized, wouldn't that make sense? It, it absolutely would. Um, you know, from running a community, and, and it was a big community, right? But the, 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 the basic premise is still the same. Unless it's a nursing home, generally, we didn't pick people up off the floor and we would call 911. And people would come in and especially if it's somebody living with dementia, they would be afraid. Um, and a lot of times um, they really didn't know how to, to support somebody who was older or living with dementia. Um, we had the same experience, you know, with the police coming in because, you know, when you had um, an abuse allegation, you have to call the, you have to call it in according to CMS regulations and reporting to the state. And the police would come in with their you know, and they're doing their job, but they've got their handcuffs and, and terrify people. Um, so I think we all need, the only way we're really going to change perceptions of aging and perceptions of individuals living with dementia is to, to educate beyond our walls. And so, you know, that's really important. We're seeing that happening in, in hospitals. There are some, you know, emergency rooms that are specifically for, for older people, um, you know, there's a lot of patronizing attitudes that happen with older people um, and individuals living with dementia. So I, I think it's brilliant what she came up with. And it's also a cool opportunity for, for providers to be part of that solution and training people, right? So you're giving back to the community and yes, the you know, fire department might get frustrated sometimes. I, we, my husband and I have a friend who's a firefighter and he shared with me how frustrating it is that to go it out and doing all this, but you know, you can help them by doing some training for them and, and offering them some different solutions for how to support people. So I don't know. It also goes back to how much do we value older people in general? I know that's so we true. Fight. We need to fight. We need to fight back against all that. And you know, it seems like 
the, the, the communities that are having these, well, I should say these states that are having the bills that are passed that are trying to prevent as many calls being made from these senior related incidents, it's, they, they don't understand the dynamic. Right, so there's a there's a miscommunication issue on both ends. There's the EMS that don't understand who the who the caregivers are. Right, they're not medical providers. So when someone falls, they don't know how to diagnose them. They don't know if something's broken. They're calling you because they're not a medical provider, and they don't know how to deal with it. You're the professional, and so they need to understand that that aspect of it. And then the caregivers need to understand that firefighters weren't trained to deal with dementia patients. Right. They weren't right. trained to deal in senior care. They were trained to fight fires and pick yeah. up people from car accidents on the freeway and save people's lives. So it is frustrating, I'm sure, for them to think they have this reality. They should be shown in the academy for being a firefighter what the true statistics are of what your calls are going to be, right? I think they get set up for an unrealistic expectation for sure. Well, and the system really isn't set up. I mean, like, you know, we were talking about, you've got the fire truck coming and the ambulance coming, and it, it's not really set up for a good use of uh, uh, community resources yeah. the way it is right now. So, Especially yeah. if it's not statistically significant. If it's 80% of their call volume, there should definitely be a different vehicle or something a little less threatening that is implemented to be used and maybe it would be less more cost effective you know if it's if it's wasting time or resources then make it more cost effective it just makes sense but like we said it doesn't always make sense to everyone <laughs> i think like you said it's it's conversations and seeing where both sides because yeah. I, I don't think either side really sees the reality of life no and, and a caregiver would never know that they've had out of the 10 calls they've had that day they've had eight that were fall incidents or somebody with a dementia you know related outbreak or something like that so um we do have a couple of questions here oh so misty says happy to hear these views so many folks treat elders wrong and without value i'm uplifted listening to this and i'm happy to have the chance to look into edenalternative.org and that's why i wanted to share it with you guys i mean really Eden Alternative is, is changing the way that we see elder care and aging and everything. So if we could implement that into all of our residential care homes, we will have the best option for senior related assisted living homes. Ever. I, I totally agree. And I would also point out that there's a really great oppor marketing opportunity by doing something differently and being able to talk about the why behind it. Um, to really differentiate yourselves about this is this is what we do and this is why we do it um, because people don't hear you know one of the things we used to ask at my community um, when we started looking at aging in a different way and the value of older people is we stopped we stopped selling everything we do for people and we would we, we still would talk about it but we would say to people who are looking at moving in what passion what gift will you bring to make this community a stronger place? And I'll tell you what, at first people were like, what do you, what? Nobody, I don't, I'm old. No, I don't have anything to give back. Oh. But once you ask that question, people start going, hey, wait a minute. I yeah. do have something that I wanna bring to this community. And I do have this passion, this skill, this whatever it is. And then they start measuring that against what they're hearing at the competitors. And I'll tell you, you start doing things differently and people want to be in a place like that. And I, and I would, I would want to be in a place. If I came in with my, because I've had the experience with my grandmother. So if I came in with my grandmother and they would have asked her that, I mean, she would have gone off on how exactly she would have been doing everything because she was outspoken and wanted to be involved in all that, but nobody ever asked her, right? right. No one ever asked her how she wanted to contribute to that home. Yeah. So although so, being yeah. in residential care was better, yeah, they still weren't asking her whether she wanted to contribute to the home to make it better, right? Right, and so asking what do you what what do you have that you want to bring here, and what do you want to learn? That's the other thing is that makes people go wait what? Because all we do is ask about their history and what was your career and da da da. It's like what's next for you? What do you want to learn? And yeah, and I you know I knew we were going to get this question. Um, so we're in the United States right we're in a lawsuit happy country do do is that a part of the transition into eat an alternative is that difficult so the question here says how does this model fare in a strongly regulated environment like california 
Well, here's what I will say is nursing homes are the most highly regulated industry there is. I don't like to call it an industry, but it's other than nuclear power plants. And this works in nursing homes. It is not, it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean that people never get cited on surveys. It doesn't mean that people don't get sued sometimes. Here's what I'd say is, is you have to work go through this in a process. It's not overnight. It's not like, pow, here we are. It's bringing along the family members, the residents, all the stakeholders, your ombudsman, your regulatory agencies. Here's what we're doing. Here's how we're moving ahead and making, especially the family members, the residents, part of that journey. When there's trust, when people know you, when they know the why behind it, what what I saw, it, it, it you know, in, in my experiences, they're less likely to go after you. But you're you're never free from that. But that's not a reason to not do the right thing. And, and so I that, think it's about communication, like you said. If you can communicate that the reason you're doing whatever somebody may think is a liability, then if you have a realistic conversation someone may be more likely to understand that you're just trying to help your community and this is what's best for this community of people and it's really about really looking at um are you eliminating risk because that's not possible you cannot eliminate all risk are you managing it right because one of the things that you get into with all this is um you know, sometimes people's individual choices for about how they want to live their life aren't what you think they should do. And there is risk involved in it, but there is risk involved in everything in, in part of our daily life. So again, it's not something you undertake lightly. That's one of the things we help organizations with is how do you move through this process so that you can create this new reality and not, you know, not end up getting yourself in a ton of hot water. I would think so. I mean, obviously other countries are different and this is probably why it works good worldwide and that there's probably not as strong of regulations in other countries than there well, are here. Well, it, it's in the nursing homes all over the country. We have CMS grant projects going on in different states all over the country. CMS is the you know Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services yeah. that regulates every nursing home in the country. They fund our training. Oh, so they know all about it. Yeah. So it's not, again, it, it's sometimes you have to fight back when you get a, a, a deficiency on a survey where you were trying to promote someone's individual choice and that's yeah. part of it. Yeah. So last question I have here is the, is the Evolve Education Platform geared towards frontline team members as well as our leadership teams? So I, there, yes. Um, there are different classes um, that will appeal to different people, but yes. Great. For everyone. And the other thing I, I should mention is we, we have an online certified Eden Associate training that, that's live, but you join um, kind of like this, um, that starts in June and it runs for 11 weeks. It's an hour and a half every week. So that might be a, a, a something some people might be interested in too. Yeah, can you, I believe I have the link for that on our marketplace, but can you send me the links for both of these and then when my, in my follow-up email tomorrow, I'll post them with the video recording of this. Perfect, it doesn't look, unless anybody has any other questions, um, Jill, this was amazing. I wish all of my webinars went like this. I mean, just such realistic conversations, just very down to earth and it seems like it should be common sense and it's not in our industry. So it's well, great. And I want to th thank you for having me here. And you know, one of the things I think is going to come out of this, um, sorry, I've got the light shining on me. One of the things I, I really think is going to come out of this pandemic is people really seeing that, you know, smaller environments with consistency, with not a huge number of staff in and out is really, it's good for a quality of, not only for quality of life, but it's good for infection control. So mm -hmm. I think you're gonna have a huge focus on, on this as an opportunity um, in the future. So that that's really exciting to me and, and thank you for all you do. And, and to all of you that are out there watching, thank you for, for running um, these homes and, and making a home for people. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. and I will tell you that's not the last, that's not the first time that I've been hearing this. It's been a, a constant reminder of that we're in the right place doing the right thing. And all of you who are either in the process of running your home, maybe you're running into some difficult times because it's not necessarily easy to open one of these assisted living homes. And maybe you're in that spot, know that you are doing the right thing, that these bigger facilities are going to work towards doing what we do. And we will hear it over and over again from professionals like Jean, or, or I'm sorry, like Jill and Jean in the industry. So it's, I can't tell you how many times, oh, we got another question. Jill offered a discount to Rolla members. If the discount on the, is the discount on the website or is there a discount code? I'll send it out in the email. No worries, you guys, you'll get it all from me tomorrow for sure. All the information. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't wait to do this again. Wait, hold on. One more. <laughs> says, Hi, Jill, I'm from Canada. Is there any Eden home model for me to look into? Oh my gosh. So our most advanced organization, we have about 20 registry homes in Canada. And I don't know what part of Canada you're in, but the most advanced home that we work with is called, um, sorry, the sun, is called um, Sherbrooke Community Center in Saskatoon. And they are at Milestone 4, which is our highest level of, of progress. And they've got um, small neighborhoods within a large, a larger campus setting. They are amazing. Go to their website, Sherbrooke Community Center, they're fantastic. I and mean, there are a lot of other great homes in Canada too. And if whoever that is wants to reach out and let me know where in Canada they are, I can make some more connections. Yeah, I'll type in Jill's email really quick. It's jvitale at edenalt.org, right? Yes. Is there a dash in between Eden Alt? Nope. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. Done. Okay, yeah, you're welcome. Everybody's saying thank you now. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for participating because that means that you guys really care about creating home in your home. So let's uh let's do that. Oh, do you, you have a Facebook page too, right? It's just Eden Alternative. Yep. Eden Alternative. So just search Eden Alternative on Facebook and you guys can go like them on Facebook. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for your questions. And Jill, I can't wait to do it again. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon.